It all started off really with the military. Anything big and expensive and technical usually is military. And the American military system is called GPS. That's the one we're all comfortable with. It's the one we all know, and it's almost the default term. Uh, but because the American military have one, the Russians needed one as well. And uh, they have a system that is called GLONASS. GPS means Global Positioning System, and so does GLONASS. Uh, because China are now a major superpower, they need one as well. They've got one called Beidou, uh, which uh, refers back to the traditional form of na navigation. Beidou actually means Big Dipper, which is the seven stars which point, point towards the Pole Star. It's how we used to get around the place. The European navigation system is called Galileo. It's named after the 16th century Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei. And in late 2016, we will be actually operational with that system. It won't be full, but there'll be enough to work with. So we refer to all these different systems as the GNSS or Global Navigation Satellite Systems. And if I uh, refer to GNSS, that's what I'm talking about. So can anyone use any of these? We have access to all these uh, systems. However, uh, it just depends on whether your phone uh, has that information in, as part of its uh, navigation chip. Most of us in Europe will have the GPS. Some of the more expensive phones will have GLONASS as well, the Russian system and in the near future it's expected that we will also have Galileo. Um, Beidou, the Chinese one, if you have a Chinese manufactured phone, then it's probably in there. And usually what happens is uh, it's turned on for an individual regional market. So if you can't get Beidou because it's not up and running yet, it won't be turned on in the phone yet. There are several areas of of the system or the, the process where errors can creep in. First of all, the satellite might not be exactly where we think it is. We're pretty good at working out what an orbit looks like and even though the satellite is traveling at about seven kilometers a second, uh, we know where they are. But even though we think of space as fairly empty, there are influences that might knock that satellite off its exact orbit. So what we, we're able to do by processing measurements from our ground stations, uh, work out when that orbit has been knocked slightly off kilter and make compensations. And as part of that signal I was talking about earlier, the, what is known as the ephemeris signal, it transmits those little corrections that the receiver needs to make in the, the program to know exactly where the signal came from. So the satellite might have a, a slight error in it to start with, and then it's got to travel 22,000 kilometers through some quite diverse space. As it enters the upper atmosphere, it's a highly charged um, atmosphere that it's coming through. And being an electronic wave, it means that it, it can be jostled around and delays occur. Uh, also, as it gets closer to us, it starts to come through the weather. And water vapor and pressure may well slow it down or refract the signal and we need to take account of that as well. So one of the ways we can do that is through modelling, the uh, mathematical models we can use to take out the information um, that's duff from the, from the atmosphere, how it's slowed down, how it's speeded up, been refracted and compensate to get a more accurate position. Uh, another thing that might happen is you might be in an area where you can't see that many satellites. The more satellites that uh, your receiver can see and process the information from, the better the, the position is going to be. Uh, but it might be that if you're in a, in a city, tall buildings, you can't see very many, many satellites, and those that you can see are all going to be directly overhead. So you won't have the opportunity to get a, a nice, clean, geometric uh, fix with signals coming from different directions, they're all becoming fairly parallel and that makes it more difficult to work out those simultaneous equations and get a good position. So that, uh, if you're in a city, you might have noticed that sometimes your, your sat nav 
really does struggle and sometimes it will put you on a street that you aren't actually on anymore uh, simply because it's trying its best to help you out. So, so you get that big sort of round dot gets bigger and bigger, doesn't it? Yes, that, that circle of probability um, with, with its little blue balloon to start with, uh, that gets bigger and the, the centre point may start to jump around. Uh, and that's simply because it's not got enough information to be able to, to tell you exactly where it is exactly with any degree of precision. So is that, is that the code in the phone just trying to guess at what street you might be on, is it? Yes, yeah, so because it assumes that you're going to be somewhere near a road to start with, especially if it's an in-car satellite navigation system. If it knows it's in a car, then it will always assume that you're on a road until it, it's proved otherwise. Uh, so in your satellite navigation on your car, you might be driving along a new piece of road and it will try its hardest to stay on the old road until all of a sudden it realises um, that you're probably driving across a ploughed field, so it'll let you and it'll, it'll lock back onto where you actually are, where, rather than saying, I'm sure he must be on the road. Please, please be, get back on the road. Uh, or if you're leaving a, a motorway junction, uh, if you've been told by your, your navigation system to leave at that, that exit and you don't, it will assume until you get past the roundabout and all of a sudden you're not turning right or left that um, you did take the, the uh, fly, uh, the, the slip road, uh, whereas in fact you've actually continued on the main carriageway. And once it realises it'll lock back onto you again. And in the case of an in-car navigation system, the, the nice voice will tell you at the next exit or, to, or when convenient to do a U-turn. Absolutely. I mean, I'm just listening to you talking about things like the weather and uh, atmosphere affecting these sides. I mean, you know, these are powerful computers and we've got clocks in the sky and lots of them. So it can't make that much of a difference, does it? The clocks in the sky, although they're very accurate, they're transmitting at a very, very low power rate because they have to rely for 12, 15 years on the, in, on the power they can get from the sun. There's no inherent battery system there that's going to give them lots and lots of power. So they're broadcasting at a low level and they're broadcasting um, in all directions. So the amount of the signal that goes in to, or comes directly to us uh, will be quite low power. However, it is a very distinctive signal. So the receiver can spot that and take away all the outside noise and background information and actually lock onto that system uh, and the signal and make sure that it's actually reading onto the satellite. Uh, so yes, um, it is a very complex, very reliable system. We've got wonderful computers to process it, but they are working with very, very low energy. And so when you get inside a building, the signal finds it difficult to penetrate bricks and mortar. And if you, for instance, have a neon light tube that's a bit faulty or a microwave going on, something like that, where you've got a little bit of leakage, then that will interfere with the signal as well and virtually sort of shout it down. So it works very well outside and it works very well where you don't have buildings in the way of your signal, but it doesn't work quite so well if you start to block off that signal and make yourself invisible from the satellite. But the other thing it will also do when you're in a city is it will start to bounce off reflective surfaces. So if you're driving around um, a, a modern city like London with lots of large glass-built glass buildings or glass-faced buildings, you'll have the signal reflecting off these and you might have two or three different versions of the same satellite signal. But every time it bounces off something, the signal gets longer and therefore it could fool the, the receiver into thinking that you're actually further away from the satellite than um, you, you actually are. And within the programme, there are ways in which we can take out those erroneous signals and just work with the real thing. A giant clock in space, about the size of a double wardrobe with huge great wings either side, the solar panels, that's what our satellites look like and they're broadcasting 24-7 the time and with that time signal they're also...